the most benign ruler of heaven in his clemency, turned his eyes to the earth, having perceived the infinite vanity of all those labours, the ardent studies without any fruit, the presumptuous self-sufficiency of man, which is even further removed from truth than is darkness from light, and desiring to deliver us from such great errors, became minded to send down to earth a spirit with universal ability in every art and every profession, who might be able, working by himself alone, to show what manner of thing is the perfection of the art of design, so as to give relief to works of painting, with correct judgment in sculpture, and how, in architecture, it is possible to render habitations secure and commodious, healthy and cheerful, well proportioned, and rich with varied ornaments. He was pleased in addition to endow him with the true moral philosophy and with the ornament of sweet poetry, that the world might choose him and admire him as its highest exemplar in the life, works, saintliness of character, and that he might be acclaimed by us as a being rather divine than human. Welcome to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm George Kinjal. I'm Luke Jones. Do you disagree with any of that? No, I mean, I can sort of see where he's coming from. I think I think it's broadly right. This is about Michelangelo. Those were the words of the uh, biographer Giorgio Vasari describing where he came from uh, and what his divine purpose on earth was, which was to be... A light. A light. And the best at everything. Yeah, someone to measure everyone else up to. We're discussing Michelangelo as an architect. But we will also be discussing quite a bit, I think, of his non-architectural works, in part from my point of view because they're so good, and also to shine a light onto his process and how his architectural works came into being. Michelangelo is a strange architect in that he used to deny that he even was one. He came to architecture relatively late in a career that started very young. And we're going to start the discussion right at the beginning of his career rather than with the very first buildings which he did. Yeah, so we might do we might do a three-parter uh, which consists of the first two-thirds of his career <laughs> in the first episode. Or even more than that, the first three quarters. And then uh, rather a lot more thinking of the stuff that we actually know something about. Maybe we should discuss some of the difficulties here. So I think this has been, I think, the hardest to research it's a huge topic. We'd slightly shied away from huge topics. It's a huge man who did a lot of things in a place and time that is very different, is very alien, and understanding the motivations and driving, which is drive and process, which is um, kind of key to what we're trying to get into when we're not taking the fizz out of things, uh, is very hard. It's also that this is a person who is identified with like two of the most famous artworks of all time whose whose work whose work is almost a, a, a kind of a cliche of a cliche yeah after but like it, the mona lisa yeah. david and the sistine chapel bedeck a million printed cushion covers and we can see that this pro- was a problem which existed even in, in his lifetime vasari is describing him as divine as someone who is not a human but one of the things which i think we would like to try and understand a little bit is his human motivations his human kind of formation yeah i when i was thinking this i wanted to start it with a man as a pretentious nod to the odyssey superficially it's easy to get caught up with how extraordinarily and inhumanly talented he was from such a young age i think i want to introduce a second difficulty which i think exists which is that he's working within a style of architecture which i think in the 21st century it's a little bit difficult to kind of stand inside, which is the classical language of architecture. And I think that this is something which we see, as it were, from quite a long way away. And that understanding what is revolutionary about what he's doing, in a way what he's, see- what he's doing can seem very continuous with what's going on because it's, it's within a sort of consistent language of... It's very easy to look at classicism and think of it as a well-established canon, an eternally established canon. Surely they got that down pat by like 500 BC or something. That's never really been true, but it's extremely untrue at the time that he's working, where really it's even at the time of his death, I would say a lot of what we consider classicism hasn't been invented yet. And most of what he's doing, he's almost 
doing for the first time. There's another thing that makes it difficult, which is that also he's a pretty mercurial guy. He liked to lie about himself. He had a problem with pride. That introductory note we had, he regarded as insufficiently complimentary, and and he needed to commission someone else to write something that would clear up all the slanders that were in it. <laughs> this is true. Um, he literally <laughs> paid someone to write something more complimentary than that. More complimentary than the statement that God personally... That God, has... God came to Earth, <laughs> seeing our error, sent to us another son. <laughs> and also, when you're trying to get into someone's working process, it really doesn't help that he burnt nearly all his drawings because he didn't want people to see what he was up to. This is quite classic, like... Well, let's go to the birth. Let's go to the birth. And we start in... Uh, Caprese, a tiny little village, well, a village of a sort of 100 houses or so, part of the kind of outer fringe of Florentine influence. In Florence, there's famously the rich family of the Medici, who are bankers, but there were lots of other rich families um, who were also engaged in finance and various other bits of trade. And he is sort of born into the fifth generation or something of a banking family. His dad doesn't seem to be especially competent loses out in trade, manages to get a the lowest rung of sort of um nepotistic judicial appointments running this village. Uh he's the he's the boss. He's the he's the like cappy in the sort of um mafia system that is how um these states run. Uh the local enforcer. And there are two others who we want to introduce to you at the same time, through whose eyes we will see the world of Michelangelo through whom we're going to experience some of his works firsthand, who, for the purposes of this, are born maybe 10 years after the man I think fi- I think they're born around f- uh, 1490. OK, yeah, let's say that. So do you want to do these? And uh, Maybe I'll introduce them. So first we have... Ricardo Cazzi, strong, broad, bright-eyed and beautiful, orphaned in the womb by treachery, charming his adoptive mother with his smile and biting the hand of the priest when offered in blessing. And Aurelio Celesti, quiet and sickly, a contemplative child, with his eyes fixed on the heavens, clasping his hands in the crib so that everyone calls him the bishop. Do we, do we, do we say why we do these stories? I mean, we've never said. We've done several episodes with these funny stories in them. Yeah, well, we could say it in one sentence. Describing buildings is boring and also difficult. And often what you're trying to describe is how you feel and it's easier to try and build up a scene that will allow you to talk about stuff you know about the feeling weight and also the kind of milieu from which um artworks are created but in a way it's quite a good it's a good antidote because in the kind of internet culture you experience them far too much by looking at pictures and I could extend internet culture to print culture as well. Far too much by looking at pictures and not enough by being. So we have the young Michelangelo. His childhood is something which he himself mythologised to a certain extent. He talked about this episode when he was about six, when his mother died, and he was sent to live with a family who were stonemasons, or who some of who were related to stonemasons. And he talked by, and in, a, in a sort of metaphorical way about having absorbed the love of stone um, in the milk. He, he spends this time in the stone quarry. And at that point, he definitely does learn to carve because there's no, he, must, he learned it very early and he must have been doing that a lot. And I think he must have been wanting to. There's an attempt to send him into town to educate him briefly, He's not very interested. He has a tutor who's a not inconsiderable um, Latin grammar teacher. And the aim of this would have been to send him into a house of banking or uh, or into the public administration in some capacity. But he doesn't... Uh, he, a few months of that and he, he doesn't really do it. He's, according to himself, going away and um, copying paintings. There is some evidence that he had taught himself to draw even before he was apprenticed at the age of 13 to the artist Domenico Ghirlandaio, um, the evidence for which is that he, even when, at the moment he was taken on, he began to be paid as an artist rather than an, as an apprentice. Which is very unusual. I mean, apprentices, normally it's the other way around. Normally, Ghirlandaio's 
pretty good painter, and certainly one of the most prominent of the t- of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but but um, Michelangelo people often want to call him a bit sort of fusty because that's what Michelangelo said. But if you look at his paintings, they're pretty good, actually. I mean, he was definitely not someone who was at the leading edge of style, but they are uh, very well constructed, beautiful renditions. Like not not particularly brilliant in light, but very good in perspective and. Um, yeah, and and portrait as well. They're f- they're full of recognisable characters. So we have the we have the kind of what like fourteen fifteen year old Michelangelo in Florence, were, uh, as this apprentice. Uh, the other apprentices would have been expected to do things like make up paint, and he was immediately put to work working in the sort of scenes and backgrounds of frescoes. And people make great arguments about over which bit doesn't really matter. And at that point, he learns the key skills for being a painter. Fresco, painting, pen, ink catching. But he's not there for long. I think it's under two years. And Gelandai is asked to send, who's got a commission elsewhere, his two most talented students to the court of Lorenzo de' Medici. Florence at this point is kind of in the autumn of this golden age of Renaissance art and architecture. That there's been, all the way through the 15th century, they've been these like extraordinary and acknowledged geniuses you know from brunelleschi through uh, donatello you know all of these people producing all this amazing work and lorenzo the magnificent who is the sort of the unofficial head of the city is acknowledged as this kind of um, wonder patron taking on the mantle the medici mantle of patronage and collecting but for him is is um for the first cosimo commissions lots of great public works yeah. and big churches and things. Uh, Lorenzo is much more focused on his court. He has a terrific collection of classical sculpture, of the works of then contemporary artists, and also a fantastic collection of people who he, collect, he collects around him, intellectuals, poets, artists. And into this collection... He places goes, the, he, the 15-year-old... The, the 15-year-old Michelangelo, who um, dazzles with his uh, precocity. There is a semi-structured sort of programme. He's taught Latin, uh, the classics, demonstrates art, and produces artwork in the court, and is an ornament to this, you know, in the, pal- in the, in the palazzo um, in itself, you know, around the courtyard. That, all that ends with Lorenzo's death, which, which happens when he's in his late teens. And fairly soon after that, he rather sensibly flees the city. One thing I wanted to do is the point at which he picks up various his sort of repertoire of technical skills. Because his career starts so early, already got this sort of complete spectrum of technical abilities. So from his painting apprenticeship, he learns the technical side of ink drawing, which is very important because it's the tool that he uses through his career, particularly his early career, to experiment and draft works as well as clay modelling. By the time he was 16, he's producing some sculptural reliefs which still survive. I think the um, Madonna by the Steps, which is quite clearly juvenile, is not quite worked out. But it's... He was 15. He was 15. Um, and then there's also this really amazing uh, small uh, relief called The Battle of the Centaurs, which you can see in his house in Florence, which is this it's this kind of writhing mass of like 20 or so figures all grappling and wrestling with each other and it's a really it's juvenile but it's a kind of a virtuoso yeah he was like right from the word go he was unbelievably talented the death of lorenzo is almost an epochal moment it ushers in a sequence of events which leads to two-thirds of a century of on and off war and the end of independent italian republics and that's going to be what's going to happen in Michelangelo's life. There's a war uh, with the French, and there's the rise of, of uh, Savonarola, the crazy preacher, friar. Less friar tuck, more um, you're all going to friar in hell. Yes, originator of the bonfire of the vanities, in which beautiful things of all kinds were burnt in the streets. Paintings, hairbrushes, mirrors. Botticelli had to burn his own things. So Michelangelo leaves. And he goes over the Apennines to Bologna, which is 
in a completely different political world and instantly is working on really prestigious sculptural commissions, making sculptures for the tomb of St. Dominic, who is a massive late medieval saint who I think died in Bologna. And he does a nice one of, of him sort of holding the city and things like that to try and increase prestige, the, 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 the prestige of the place. And you're seeing immediately that, um, firstly, everyone recognises him as this wonder child. He's not quite an acknowledged genius yet, but he everyone takes him seriously as, as like a really serious sculptor, yeah. even at this very young age. He's definitely a prodigy. Even back then when people got on with their lives... You don't normally give, like, prestige commissions to teenagers. That's unusual. It's during this period that he also draws the attention of some people in Rome. Well, um, uh, an, an entrepreneurial friend he's fallen in with suggests that why don't you do a uh, cherub and then and then smash it up a bit? Because you're very good at, you know all about these classical sculptures. You've been looking at them. You can smash it up a bit and make it a classical sculpture. And then I've got this friend, Mickey, who will sell it to a cardinal and will make loads of money. And what happens is, um, firstly, Mickey runs off with all the money. He might not have been called Mickey. He's called something. I don't know. <laughs> but like the but the like the the weird the weird dodgy dealer. Guess what? Trousers all the cash, and then they're also rumbled. Yeah, the cardinal finds out that it's not a real antique. This but, is by the way going on all the time. Yeah. Like everyone is um, notably satirised in Hilary Mantel. It's got uh, has the young um, uh, Cromwell. Oh, really? Doing this thing of selling fake antiques? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, doing a cherub. Doing a cherub, which I think is totally taken from Michelangelo. That's actually. a nice little reference. But the cardinal wants to meet the sculptor. It's too good. The cherub is too good. And this is rather a sort of a saucy, uh, sort of a rather unsavoury cardinal. It's a, a card- one of these cardinals who was elevated to the college at the age of 16 and who has rather a lot of outside interests. And Yes, during, during a period of the papacy known as the kleptarchy for some reason... <laughs> So Michelangelo is introduced, and this is how he receives the commission for the statue of the naughty Bacchus, which is this kind of drunk Greek yeah. uh, figure. It's not very good. It's it's a bit of a strange one. It's got like um, a, a quite kind of authentic looking belly. It what does look it does look it drunk. Does. Yeah, it's kind of slumped. It's got this cup. It was um it was felt that even for such a louche cardinal the figure was slightly he's scandalous. he's a sort of roman sex god god of like wine and partying and uh i think he might be the tutelary deity of the podcast actually i'm not sure bacchus bacchus <laughs> it's worth saying that the real catholic fight back hasn't begun but the period before then is a period of like some quite serious grade papal corruption you know orgies in the papal palace murdering and poisoning galore people are slightly getting fed up with this and uh, uh and, and too much too much pagan uh, party gods the cardinal thought it was actually too scandalous even for him to own it ends up being owned by his banker but michelangelo has become a uh, sort of uh, someone who is known to the great and the good of rome as a sort of prodigal and brilliant sculptor and it's through that that he receives a commission from another cardinal to carve a, a pietà for his tomb. A pieta, by the way, is, um, it, it pieta, Dali always corrects my pronunciation, it, it, but pity, it's, um, it's the dead Christ and Mary's looking at him, and you can have a load of supporting cast if you want. And Michelangelo has a slightly unusual take on it. The statue is made, conveniently the cardinal dies just before it's about to be finished, and it's placed on his tomb in a side chapel of the old basilica of St. Peter's in, uh, in the Vatican. And, and we're going to go on. Our two characters who were following through this epoch are, like Michelangelo, Tuscans. Like him, they're Florentines. And like him, they're in exile during this story. So we're going to follow them to Rome, where around, just before the dawning of the new century, they're going to encounter this work of his. Their father leaves them in the morning to go and speak to an uncle he's never heard of, on whose charity, here in exile, they must rely. The streets of Rome are full of mud and soldiers, and while they wait for his return to escape the noise and danger of an uncertain foreign city, 
they cross Pope Sixtus's new bridge out to the pastures in the shadow of the crumbling Basilica of St. Peter. Inside, they found a vast and ancient space filled with smoke and far-off singing. Ricky, noticing the magnificent echo of his hobnailed boots against the worn marble floor, clatters his way up the aisle. Aurelio, his heart shrinking in embarrassment, tiptoes up between the monuments, avoiding the stern gazes of the darkly clad men bustling past. Walking past the tall base of some recently installed monument, he has a glimpse of shimmering fabric. He stops. No, only seeming. Stone, ruffled and shining impossibly. A light reaches out to him from inside it. High up, he sees a face, milky and perfect. Mary, eyes half-closed, in serene and incomprehensible sorrow. And between the two of them, nestled softly in the folds of the fabric, somehow both lank and supple, the limp, punctured hand of the Lord. An echoing crash reaches the side chapel from far away. Some hours later, when Ricky has returned, red-arsed and bawling, they discover that this was a candlestick tipped over in an optimistic attempt to steal it. In the meanly proportioned annex of his uncle's house, he dreams of her face above him, his little body enveloped in the buttery folds of her gown. So I think one of the things to talk about is this is a work, the composition of which is ingenious and revolutionary, and part of what it makes it so successful and so instantly recognised as a product of, of genius is uh, how it deals with the inherent problems of the form. And we can see this if we look at many pietas, if we look at um, them in painting, if we look at them in sculpture. One of the problems is that Mary is a woman... Jesus is like a tall young man, and if he's lying in her lap for her to kind of gaze upon him and his wounds, he's really much too big. There are some of these depictions in, in which members of the supporting cast, kind of Joseph of Arimathea or whoever, are added at either side to kind of prop him up. Yeah, so, you can get like as many as sort of six people around. around yeah, the body it becomes if you really it, be- it becomes rather like a, a kind of a bridge between these supporting peers. Also, there's different ways of dealing with the body of Christ um, and Mary you know Mary's like 50 at this point in the chronology or you know in her late 40s also Christ has been tortured and mutilated so so often you get sort of gothic representations where you know he's sort of spurting gobbets of blood left right and centre and like huge gaping yeah lacerations viscera and, pointing, yeah. Pull, pulling out wounds all of this is got rid of by Michelangelo who has an interesting composition, one which is is very 15th century in some ways. Yeah. It's that pyramid, which is yeah. the kind of perfect golden form for, you know, for God. Although in in other respects, it relies it relies very much on some quite extreme distortion of the forms of the people involved. So one of the things which he has done is to make m- the, uh, the lap on which the Christ is sitting both obscured by this... Um, extraordinary kind of billowing moving drapery and that allows him to make it actually much larger than is really feasible so that the balance between the two figures can work and actually mary's legs hidden under all of that drapery oh they're massive i mean you're seeing in it several there's several things going on one is it's obviously massively virtuoso in terms of the carving you know this this the fabric the sort of, you know, the semi, like, exposed body underneath all this, like, rippling drapery. The, 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 like, translucent quality of the material. The utter, like, finish of the polish. Also, the, cl- the close observation of human form. Quite, there's an incident quite early on. Uh, we, we, mi- we missed out lots of bits of his life when he's going back home or going to various other places, yeah. which don't really matter. But he spends quite a while dissecting corpses, in a hospital and he's always got this real interest in very superficially precise anatomy which he knows exactly how to do but then through his whole career is totally willing at any moment to subvert and to distort and to distend and change there is this kind of compromise with between verisimilitude the medium 
and the the desired impression so if you look at, at jesus's hands you look at them and after a little while you notice this lattice of veins on the back of them which seem astonishingly lifelike but which actually in fact in order to be noticeable are quite exaggerated that that in order to make them stand up enough they have to be carved in a way which is much in much starker relief than they would actually be in real life yeah i mean you say that there's a conflict between verisimilitude it's, no it's a kind of a comp- it's a kind of a compromise between them the iconic image that the feat is that the iconic image is the absolute paramount and yet it superficially appears perfect and like a perfect naturalistic representation when really it has been massively distorted shrunk squashed compressed cartoonized and yet it holds this completely naturalistic form together it's still got some things about it which are quite young it's very flashy it the the level of polish i think would have been quite extraordinary at the time how um shiny it is yeah it must have been extremely time consuming to do as well yeah he never stopped uh, this is something you generally get he never stopped working he absolutely he just worked 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 worked, worked. he wasn't there wasn't a lot else going i don't think there was a great deal of extracurricular activity with michelangelo he would go and look at things both mary and are uh, 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 and jesus are archetypes yeah. they are like the she is not she is not mary suffering mother of a of a dead son mary of her 40s careworn traveled she is the mother of god the virgin mother eternal beatific glowing floating floating on this sort of billowing throne rock and jesus is in violet body yeah. for all its punctured and slashedness yeah. the wounds are very tasteful yeah, <laughs> you know very... precise yeah. this piece was a massive hit and you can see why it's very impressive and um oh, he... yeah. after this he was always seen as one of the foremost artists of his yeah he's a genius and uh he gets a bit grumpy he's hanging around and some people are like oh who did that and they name some guy whose name i can't remember but who'd been dead for some time yeah yeah yeah, some nobody and then he flies into a rage and breaks into the church at night and writes his name all over it <laughs> <laughs> you can still see this on um mary's kind of uh shoulder band thing yeah. i mean he's done it very well but it is quite clearly like written in quite quickly overnight the statue is now hidden behind this sort of bulletproof glass because during, I think, the uh, the eighties, it was attacked by an insane Hungarian man with a tiny hammer. He was a he was a geologist. It was a geology <laughs> pick. It's like a tiny little rock hammer, <laughs> who shouted, "I am the living Christ!" They then uh, jumped up on it and started swinging away. Yeah, and he swung away for quite a while, I think. Yeah. Also, people stole all the bits that he knocked off, so that they had to make them again. I think some of them were returned eventually. And these opportunities, they 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 um they did some analysis and worked out where the stone came from, which is what they did when another insane person attacked David a few years <laughs> later with another tiny hammer. This time, I think he wasn't a Hungarian, but an Austrian. I don't think that they should let you in with any kind of hammer, even a small one. He has no deranged Central Europeans with hammers. There should be no a no hammer rule. Do you want to see? Do you want to hear about the contract to design it? He was paid. 450 gold ducats it's a lot to finish it in one year and then another 150 no 150 and then 100 every four months until it was all done in fact he took two years if he'd done it in the time allowed the guy wouldn't have been dead he would have lived to see it completed a bit of a shame really it's quite nice he would have nice to have seen it this is a general theme michelangelo almost doesn't finish any i mean he finishes almost nothing like very very few of his things are finished and this gets worse and worse as he goes on. Do you want to say anything else about this? Um, when you look at it, the Pieta, it's very easy to look at it through the lens of later Baroque sculpture. At this time, some Roman particularly and Greek sculpture was being rediscovered. So there's lots of the, 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 the famous torso, which I forget the name of, is discovered. And um, the, the guy and his sons, who I forget the name, mm-hmm. Lacoon. How do you pronounce it? Lau Lau Korn or something. Lau Korn. Yeah, the guy with the snake. Yeah, yeah, he um he's the guy who tells the Trojans that they should beware of Greeks. Lau Korn. Lau Korn. 
It's got an umlaut, which I think is a New York Times umlaut, meaning in place of an apostrophe. Anyway, um, I'm not sure if he'd seen that. That's in the Pope's collection and is dug up around this time. So those are the things that he's thinking about. He's looking straight back to the classics. Does this sense, you, when you look at it, it kind of looks like he's about to slide off her lap. There's the way in which the drapery is like bunched up under his trailing leg as if it's about to stray, uh, sort of to slip off. Um, the way that she's grasping him under the arm. Yeah, the way the fabric is squashed by her finger. Yeah. Also, so much drapery. Yeah. So much fabric. He's like, he really is going, I can do fabric. Yeah, he's very like, well. He certainly can. And the, between his two, the two kind of dead fingers, there's this little sort of um, fold of drapery which has got caught in it in this way, which is um, once you see it, it's hard to unsee. The the body is the body of Christ is so loose. Yeah, he's sort of um, he's so relaxed. You know, his head is kind of yeah, and he's yeah he's he's like some he's like a sort of, so kind of limp. dish of pasta that's about to scoosh off the plate. Yeah. You know. Fairly shortly after this, he went back to Florence, where things had changed a bit since he'd been away. Um, And he was able either through, maybe through letters written by friends, or maybe through arguments made on his own behalf, to secure this colossal, long-abandoned bit of old stone, of old marble, which had been sitting in the cathedral workshops in Florence, which had been botched by another sculptor 40 years before. And this would become one of the most famous sculptors in, sculptures in the history of art, the David. It took him three years to complete, and it became seen as an image of the Republic, uh, watchful, alert, in readiness, in the central square of the city, looking guardedly towards Rome. Going back to the man and the place, he's gone back to Florence... There's the council that's building the cathedral. The cathedral is basically built, and it's been built for ages. But they're sort of adding sculpture and buttresses and things as they have been for hundreds of years. It's a huge piece of stone. Huge. I mean, the sculpture is more is getting on for six metres tall. And it's one hell of a thing to carve. And it, this was a time when people were still trying to make huge sculptures. Leonardo da Vinci had been failing to make a huge bronze horse for a very long time, which is something that Michelangelo took the piss out of after he finished his massive sculpture. The original idea was that he was meant to go on top of one of the buttresses of the cathedral, and this guy had been commissioned to do it and had kind of got as far as smashing some big holes out of it and had then given up. And then at some point, sort of intervening point, someone else had had a go and also given up. And so it's this extremely compromised bit of stone, which I think you should imagine it as having some sort of big holes in inconvenient places near the bottom, but being extremely large. Yes, and also having, I mean, I think quite large, I mean, I think the person who worked on it worked on it for months, hacking, you know, roughing out a big section and just being overcome by the task. You wouldn't know it looking at it. It looks immensely finished, but is quite flat and compressed. Should we just talk about David? It's so hard to take away from your mind the hackneyed cliche. It's very good. He's so buff. He's a, he's a very beautiful boy, isn't he? He's so buff. He's very beautiful. So what are the things... I think that because... I imagine if you type, like, art into Wikipedia or sculpture, like, yeah, this is the thing which comes... This is probably the thing which comes up. So it's very hard to evaluate something like this in 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 its own terms because it's already such a kind of incredible... Um, yeah, it's kind well, of the term I'll, of reference I'll, for I'll everything I'll tell you else. what I like about it. Yeah. This is how is my subjective view of it. Yeah. It's this man-boy, David. At one level, he's obviously, like, the perfect young man. And I think it's very important that he's young. Although he's, like, incredibly buff, he's a youth. Yeah. He's slender. And he's got his sling, and he's looking out, and he's so perfect. And if any Goliaths come along, he's just going to nail them. It's different from pretty much all of the other representations of David in that it, he's, it's f- before he's killed Goliath rather than after. Yeah. The standard like re- David representation is this rather self-satisfied young guy standing on this enormous decapitated head. Or whacking his head off with a massive sword. Um, whereas this is which is a fantastic symbol for a republic. 
kings, you come near and I will kill you in a second with my sling. I'm watching you. There are these features which we've already highlighted. So there are these, um, this sense that you can see the muscles moving under the skin. What appears to be this like extraordinary accuracy, this kind of representation of true natural detail in a level of to a level of realism which is really unprecedented but which in fact is achieved through knowing just how much to exaggerate it well in some places a lot some places are very exaggerated and some are almost but they don't look exaggerated is the thing if the, what, one of the things which is strange about it if you if you were to kind of focus on like a little element like his hand it starts to look a little bit strange because they think because they are made a little they're made too big they're made they're kind of accentuated. Or if you were to look at his muscles outside, the muscles of his chest outside of the context of his whole body, they look like super buff. He looks, he looks like, a, you know, like a cage fighter or something. But, but that's because you're not seeing this kind of slenderness and kind of adolescence, which is ex- expressed. He's got quite a waspy waist, hasn't he? He's got this like yeah, yeah, yeah. lovely fitted, tapered body and this big head. The parts all look different together than they do singly. And he's got, yeah, he's got all the, he's like all the masculine virtues. You know, he's super buff. He's super precise. Yeah. This drag, this giant killer's killing modus operandi is the single utterly precise hit with a rock. It's, it's like, it's like sniper assassin. I think the area where the, um, where this play between kind of realism and exaggeration is easier to read is in the face like the face does look quite exaggerated the face has as with his paintings it's slightly cartoonish or like the expression is He's much very too strong in, noses it's too very intense strong brows also over articulated detail the over articulated hair his strange sort of mullet going down the back of his neck also the pose which the subtlety of which i think is really quite remarkable that he is just standing but he's standing in a way which speaks to the possibility of movement like he could spring into action at any moment he's he's it's semi it's sort of semi contraposto it's semi that like you know one bent leg half twist yeah so beloved he's poised but it's not quite it's like halfway into a step but not you know 10 percent of the way into a step it's really it's very hard to do because what you're trying to show is impassivity in the face of something fearsome. It's not it's not do- docile impassivity. It's yeah, but it's very, it's very difficult to it's, actually. That is really difficult to convey. Like it's really difficult to convey someone not reacting in a way that is charged with uh, like internal um, you know energy because actually often it just looks like they're bored or something. This is the thing of, um, you know, bad acting in made-for-television movies and things like that, is people trying to do, like, uh, stoic impassivity and instead coming across like they're really sto- stoned or <laughs> the something. The <bottomized. laughs> Yeah. Have yeah. <laughs> you seen a lot of? That's hard. That's really hard to do. Well, he's got it. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing. It's a masterwork. There's one part of his body which I know you want to talk about. What, Little Willy? I, I, you put Little Willy... No, what did you put? You put, like, dick in the thing... In the notes. Penis. Where does it say? I put penis in three exclamation marks. Penis in three exclamation marks. Penis! <laughs> He's a youth. Yeah. He's not very developed. I think, I think just an image will do. It's good. You don't need, you don't need to be that big. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not the shape of the ship. It's the motion of the ocean. This guy is strong <laughs> and precise. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, I, I don't know if this is... I haven't been to France for quite a while. Um, but you can get all these, like, you know, outside there's the guy selling all the little plaster casts of David. And you can get two versions. One of which, one of which has got even bigger hand and hands and a massive dick. <laughs> or you can get the, uh, like, recreation of conventional dick size. What do you think? Do you think it's the correct choice of dick size? I think it's perfect, yes. I think it's perfect too. Because, <laughs> I mean, the eye naturally, like, reaches to it. In Michelangelo generally... The kind of centre of energy is like the belly button. Yeah. And he would generally start by carving right down to there and then like work out yeah. from the middle. And in a lot of his drawings, you can see the energy really, you know, it's sort of the umphalos. It's like the centre. Be nice to have, be nice to have a sort of appreciative, uh, someone, someone who is able to appreciate it more than me, I think. In to, uh... <laughs> I mean, we haven't spoken about this, but the, the, 
that Mick, the Michelangelo male gaze, it starts at the six pack. It's focused on men, naked men. It's it's charged with sexuality. And they are sort of obviously like sexual and beautiful, and gorgeous, perfect. I mean, this is a thing which I guess people probably know, but Michelangelo was gay. Well, I think I think I'd want to shed some of the implications. So I would be happier saying like Leonardo, like like I'd be I'd be happy to say um, Donatello was gay. I'm I, I'm much happier to say that than because you know he had he had a sort of obvious sex life. You know there were all sorts of problems with that, but. Michelangelo, I haven't read enough to know if he actually did anything about it, but I don't think it was him doing things about it was the important thing. Um, I, I couldn't tell you if he was a man who had sex with men. What he definitely is, is in touch with his desire, his attraction, his, his magnetic animal attraction to this gorgeous male body. And there's that strange moment of um, looking at the corpses in the hospital spends this time examining the corpses of young men. And I think it's a little bit like that. It's not... His sexuality is not a happy one. He's not even like Leonardo, yeah. who definitely did have sex with men, maybe not exclusively, who who kind of had, a, had an outlet. I think for him, he's really conflicted. And I don't think that conflict ever goes away. But it also kind of charges... Yeah, it's one of the forces... It's one of the forces that electrifies his work and um, people can say that he is electrified by god and by this body but i think they both reach towards that sort of longing the fear the god fearingness is also to do with the 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 you know the big emotions longing so many of his sculptures are trying to tear themselves out of stone yeah. they're straining muscles coming out of stone Coming out of their middle, straining like the straining six pack. Yeah. Um, you've got down here other Davids. You know, I mean, the, they're these con- the kind of the they abide by this convention that David's already killed Goliath. You you you, yeah. you, you mentioned you mentioned Donatello's David, who is this unbelievably fabulous um, David with like he's a huge, such a, he's, he's such a twink. He has like he's he's like this he's this little beautiful but slender boy. He's got a, like this very dandy hat on. Um, he's got this long thin sword, and he's sort of stepping on this enormous head. And that that one was was in the same place, and that was the Medici bronze made by this point sort of 60 years earlier again this is another image which wasn't there until it's like you know someone had to someone had to get up in the morning and write mozart it wasn't there until someone did it shall we just talk about so it's finished it's immediately clear that it's amazing and they have a meeting they call like a big council of lots and lots of eminent artists and architects and things to try and decide what to do with it and as you've said the eventual decision is that it goes in this place on the main square and this is done during a brief period of non-Medici rule. And um, it's kind of interesting. We have the minutes of this meeting, or at least there's a kind of uh, quite abbreviated form of them. It's sort of funny because nothing has changed in the world of meetings. What happens is that one person suggests something incredibly stupid and then it throws the whole thing off course. In this case, it's um, uh, Giulio de San Gallo says, well, because the marble has been outside for so long, it will be wet and cannot go outside because it will go, it will dissolve. And everyone else says, well, I was going to suggest we did this, but in fact, now, since since we know that it's going to dissolve in the rain, we'd better put it in the loggia of uh, this or that yeah. palace. And for some reason, actually, the conclusion of the minutes as we have is completely different from what they ended up doing with him. Giulio de Sangallo, famous and highly experienced architect who was yeah. obviously talking a load of ru- rubbish, yeah. did pretty well. It was outside until, I think, it was like the 70s, wasn't it? <laughs> It did, it did, it went inside. And in fact, they had to clean it up because it was, it turned out it was slightly soft marble. It will, I mean, this is another thing that it, it had taken him how many years to make it? Three. Three years of carving it, which is another insight into his personality that he was just like. And I think it took something like 300 people to move it. So he's summoned back to Rome by Pope Julius um, to make a tomb for him. This is like a couple of years after the David. But. 
Pope Julius, who's known as the war- I think he's known as the Warrior Pope, um, was very preoccupied by fighting and short of money, and the project kind of lapsed. And Michelangelo left again, very unhappy. Um, and then later, another couple of years later, he was persuaded back again. Uh, this time with a different commission, which was to paint the vault of the Sistine Chapel. Wow, I'm feeling this insane sort of lurching yeah. sensation as we like skip over huge acres of history and career well no it's like four years i know but so much stuff happens yeah i know well, i think we're gonna we might return to some of this because there's an awful lot going on in the world julius is an inc- immensely important person <laughs> essentially like just an overview of the popes there'd been a series of incredibly corrupt popes yeah. and uh, a lot of naughty business going on uh, and julius is one who seeks to He's not very beholden to anyone and he seeks through force of arms to kind of restore the lands and the power of the papal states. And not not just through arms, through arms, diplomacy, culture, and also does an enormous amount of getting projects started. Like the whole thing of rebuilding the basilica wouldn't have happened yeah. without he's, him. He's the originator of um, rebuilding St. Peter's. Um, but in this case, let's talk about the Sistine Chapel because this is... We're just going from one <laughs> incredibly famous artwork to another, and we can't even talk about it for that long. But but this, in in fact, when you go there now, you see a, a number of works which are kind of that some of them are much later. But this one is the one which is on the ceiling. If you haven't heard of the Sistine Chapel, probably read about it. Yeah, just have a look at it. In fact, the way in which it's represented is often slightly misleading. In fact, I think that the image which is most associated with it is an extremely cropped one of a particular scene in which um, God is kind of reaching out and giving life to Adam. The Sistine Chapel had been built around, I think, the time he was born by another one of the popes. They're rebuilding. There's not much in the Vatican. Um, Rome had shrunk to this tiny little sort of bit with ruins everywhere, and they're, they're kind of rebuilding it. You know, a hundred years ago, Roman had almost no one in it at all. It just exists through being sponsored by the Papal See. So they built this big chapel. It's very plain on the outside. It's already got a very fancy floor. Yeah. And he manages to get the commission to paint the ceiling yeah. and proposes a massively elaborate project for it, yeah. which is masses of paintings instead of a sort of decorated ceiling yeah. in a semi-architectural frame, which is easy to forget about. The structure is sort of columns in you know it, it painted on the whole thing is just painted columns in stone with sort of frames between them um and in those frames there are you know stories from the bible figures from the bible pagan figures all sorts of things it's like a cartoon strip in an architectural frame one of the things which it does very cleverly is yeah it creates this kind of architectural frame in which these different things can be can be kind of separated from each other, but in a way which is still a unified whole. And he also deals with what would otherwise be a slight sort of portrait landscape kind of problem of the ceiling, which is very it's this very long chapel. He wants to represent the episodes as it were in kind of kind of a series of like landscape format um, images going all the way down it. But he also wants to deal with this with these long sides where the vaults meet the walls. And he does this by having these seated figures who are, who are kind of sitting on top of the wall, as it were. And then these figures ab- above them who are also sitting, but kind of reaching around and doing different strange positions and kind of motioning at these images, which are then behind this stone vaulting. A lot of the less famous ones are very interesting and complex, like spatial arrangements in them. You know, there's nowhere where there's sort of one thing happening in the distance, one in the mid-ground, one in the foreground. Yeah. His paintings always have a great deal of, or a rich sense of perspective and three-dimensionality. Yeah. Not only are the figures kind of contorted and have their, you know, like, there's a lot of, like, drawing of fingers and toes, you know, in, yeah. in like, highly foreshortened perspective. Overall, compositionally, it isn't, it's still a bit of a mess, isn't it? Still a bit, like, incomprehensible. Like it's probably well. There's a lot of there's a lot of things which are mysterious. There's a whole category of figures in it which people don't really know what they are or what what they're meant to be about. Some of the bits. That, what's that one we found that it's like one of the corners is just like what's going on there? It's like through a wall, 
someone's what there's like three different time periods in this one someone's being crucified but in a w- sort of perspective where they it's almost as if we're looking at it side on there's some very there's some very strange things going on it's like take but i mean essentially he's sort of taking the wall paintings of chapels which have been going on through the whole renaissance and making a completely different context for them on a ceiling presumably because he sort of wants to like show off and up his commission there are various sort of heroic uh, stories associated with it one is the fact that he paints the whole thing himself didn't have any assistance despite having been an assistant himself on projects like this you know there are he did have assistants in his career but they are they cannot he cannot work with anyone who's got even like the slightest like creative input and so uh, but but because he's got this insane work ethic and you could paint these enormous areas in one go. Yeah, he's an absolute man machine. So he sort of would sketch out a little bit a few times and then we'd get them to plaster up and then we'd plaster this sort of like, paint this kind of like, you know, bedroom wall sized area every day. Yeah. The figures in it, up close and personal, are big. They're, you know, I mean, they vary in size because they're all sort of different shapes and sizes of people. But they're, you know, and he would do it without... For the most part, anyway, without any... There were various techniques of sort of, like, gridding up a drawing and transferring it onto the wall and then, like, quickly bashing it out, which is how most people do it. He would just, like, memorise it and do it. The project, which was the first thing which Pope Julius had kind of pitched to him, this tomb for which stone had been bought, was kind of going on in the background. And when he finished the Sistine Chapel, he went on to seriously carving some of the figures for it. It was meant to be this enormous assemblage of... And actually, I think Michelangelo had wanted to be the lead architect on... St. Peter's. And the Pope had quite reasonably said, no, we'll get someone who knows what they're doing. And had given him... And originally this was going to be like the huge sculptural assembly in the middle. Yeah, was going to be this enormous tomb. And it's covered in all of these slaves who represent the like the arts and sciences. This is like... This is sort of really... It's, it's sort of... I mean, it goes to various cra- different... It's this crazy allegory, basically. Like that, a- that the Pope is, is freeing the arts and sciences from slave... Sciences from slavery. Is that it? Yeah. So there's this huge pyramid of sculptures, most of which are... Yeah. Um, there's, the, there's the chained arts in its broad definition, which Julius is going to release. Michelangelo, his preferred thing, his, his favourite artistic expression, is to liberate forms, men, from stone, in a contorted, twisted way. And he, he literally talks about it as, he wouldn't have a plan of what to do. He would cut down to the, the belly button, and then he would just cut around the shape of the body that he felt in his mind, that he saw you know, sort of synesthetically. There's, um, there's something inconvenient which happens, which is obviously this project is unbelievably large and, and grandiose. Um, and actually within a year of the completion of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the person for whom the tomb is intended, uh, Pope Julius, was dead. And obviously after his death, they can still keep making the tomb, but it becomes politically very difficult to keep putting the budget up. So uh, a Medici has taken over and wants him to do stuff for Florence. So, and it's, it's that which leads to his first, in this case, unrealised architectural commission, which is a project to build a facade for the Cathedral of San Lorenzo in Florence. Before we talk about that, check out, check out the um, unfinished sculptures. They're very good. We don't have the time to talk about them properly. I would love to. I think they're, they're fascinating, wonderful, very dynamic, beautiful pieces of sculpture. Yes, so back to the Medici church. So he's commissioned, and it's a big, it's a big project which he wins in competition, first of all, with a partner who he then manages to get booted off the job so that it's him alone. This is a facade for the big yeah, Medici religious compound. In Florence. It's the other cathedral, and it's the one identified with the Medici family. Yeah, you, you, you can tell which one it is now, because it's the one that doesn't have a facade, and that will tell you the first thing you need to know about this project. Across most of Western Europe, church facades are very bling before this point. You know, you know, think of sort of Schach, all those sculptures going off in every which direction. They didn't do very much of that in Italy. In Italy, it tends to be, if you think of the Sistine Chapel, there's nothing on the outside at all. And it tends to be all about inner bling. And they would often have just sort of rendered fronts. Now, Alberti had done a polychrome marble one 
for the church by the train station, which I forget the name of, yeah. which is sort of bling, but equally it is just a sort of flat dressing, flat yeah. geometric dressing. And people across Italy were experimenting with different ways of dealing with the facade, but it usually wasn't high priority. The, the church in this case had been built, yeah. so there's already a church, there's already great side chapels, it's got a plain front. There's an intrinsic um, uh, architectural problem which people are dealing with with these facades, which is that the standard form of these churches is that you have uh, a quite high nave, which is the big long middle bit going to, up towards the altar, and then you have either one or two aisles, which are typically kind of lean-to sort of structures, leaning against the side of the big high nave. So that if you're going to stick something on the front of it, it has to deal with this kind of ch- this. It has to deal with this change in height. And in the case of San Lorenzo, in fact, it's got these two steps: first from the nave down to an intermediate aisle, and then down to a lower aisle again. And um, this is something which is quite difficult to make look good. In uh, Leon Battista Alberti's one, he deals with the problem by having a high level and a lower level, and then having these great, like, enormous, exaggerated, swirly things which bridge in a sculptural way the gap between these, or the like, the difference between these two levels. Michelangelo is conflicted because what he wants to do really is to do the whole thing as one like enormous equally grand thing but it's a problem because from the back that's going to look weird you're going to be seeing as it were the back of the stage scenery and the solution which he comes up with is to is to develop the facade into something which has depth and is in fact a um what's called a narthex so a tr- sort of transverse hall a porch yeah so that it, it has depth it's actually a little building stuck on the front of the church something we should have said at the beginning is that he got the commission to do the sculptures for it he had no architectural experience apart from sort of sketching out different options for this tomb and the guy he kicked off was the guy who was going to do the architecture uh, but he was like i'm gonna do both and <laughs> this is such a, such a michelangelo thing to do i will do everything so that's michelangelo move one i will do everything michelangelo move two is i will make it four or five times larger than it was intended to be. Yes, and I will cover every surface in sculptures by me. He envisaged the entire front, the architectural form of which, the in James Ackerman's um, classic book about it, there's a whole chapter. I find it quite hard to say very much about it because it's, but it's just this big, enormous rectangle divided in by these pillars at the bottom level and these attached pilasters on the top level but really it was it it's a sculpture a framework for these vast number of freestanding and relief sculptures of different kinds which would have been of enormous size i mean i can say a couple of things about the architecture so the architecture before this if you think of brunelleschi or you know which is a long time before and his followers but like two generations of them are churning out this stuff which is squares semicircle circles and some rectangle arranging and flat or platonic you can regard his sort of rectangle arranging as sort of intermediate he's he doesn't the way he fiddles around with proportions is he's not very interested in the famous shapes golden sections and double cubes and all that sort of stuff he just does it by eye which is innovative but although he's made the thing three-dimensional it is still completely flat And it's about circles, arrangements of circles and rectangles. And he, in some senses, although this is already most of the way through his career uh, as an artist, is is quite immature, is almost completely immature as an architect, in that he has problems of representation. This is something we've talked about with other architects. The way he draws, he doesn't draw the whole thing encrusted in sculpture, which he's proposing to do, which would massively compromise all the sort of proportioning so what happens then? Does he go to the point of trying to buy some stone for this? I think he He's, then... He, he um, spends about three years picking out stone for it in quarries. And then it's cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> it was an impossible project. It took him three years to make David. Yeah. This has got many Davids worth of sculpture on it. And as he's someone who had a complete inability to let anyone else do anything, it's impossible. You know, we went to um, Postman's Palace. So in France, there's this weird monument done by this postman who hit his head on a rock 
a nun decided to devote himself to art. Um, and he's very proud that he did everything himself. But he did it all with concrete, and it's not very big. And also looks like it was done quite fast. Yeah, yeah. and I would say that is about the maximum scope, if you want to look at of what someone can achieve in their spare time in a life. This is way more than that. It's completely grotesque. I think it was a good introduction to him. There are several sort of ways in which he slowly makes this sidestep into architecture. One is at the level of skills, I guess. Yeah. Also, just like working up in the scale, right? So you've got the tomb, and he's p- fiddling around with different compositions of sculptures, and it goes through loads of, you know, is it going to be a pyramid, or is it going to be smaller or longer or flatter or taller? And he goes through different shapes of that. There's this, and there's what we're going to talk about next, the chapel. And all of those are hybrid projects. They're projects that are mainly he's working as a sculptor, but which have an architectural element to them. And by the end of that, he can do... I know Kung Fu. He can do architecture. And rather disappointingly as an architect, he can do it better than pretty much anyone else. I mean, it's through the same kind of structure of patronage that he's going to get his next architectural commission, which will be the first one to be carried through and completed. Um, It's in the same complex. We started talking about this relationship to Brunelleschi, who is the great architectural master of the early renaissance and that uh, comparison is completely explicit in this new project which is for a funerary chapel in uh, in the cathedral and it is it begins as a twin for a famous work of brunelleschi the sacristy which he had built it's kind of on the right hand side of the nave as you go in yeah so they're like a pair on either side of the church basically yeah. And the old and Brunelleschi's one is very beautiful, classical of the period, mixture of plaster and this grey stone. It's a cube with a hemisphere on top of it. It feels very. It's, it's an amazing space. Yeah. I think I I I'm very susceptible to this sort of thing. It's these pure forms, these very carefully scaled elements which are assembled to accentuate these forms. And it's essentially in three materials, which is white render, this grey stone, which picks out the details and creates the sort of lines around the edges. And then these funny, um, uh, like, enamel tondos, which are blue, like circular reliefs. Its beauty is in its simplicity and unity. And the points where it has detail, it has a very fine detail, which is really kind of crisp and expressed. And Michelangelo, he's, oh, yeah, to do the twin. It's to do the twin. It's referred, they're referred to as misleadingly as the new and old sacristies in fact the new is not a sacristy at all but a chapel to commemorate two members of the medici family who both have the names of famous members of the medici family but aren't them they're other they're weirdly cosimo and lorenzo they're but they're... Cool, yeah, yeah no um i keep i keep calling them all giuliano but they're not it's all names that begin with a g and a slightly different to that anyway this is lorenzo the incompetent um <laughs> Died age 21 of syphilis, having lived a rather hard um, hard and rather fun life. There's some very camp paintings of him, briefly Duke of Urbino. It, the, like, the purpose of it is that you the tombs are there and the priests go and say masses there. So the only purpose of this room is, yeah, yeah, like a priest and an altar boy will go in several times a day and pray for the souls of these of this syphilitic saberite and um, another minor member of the Medici family. Maybe we should start by describing its transformations. Yeah, I think we should go with the design process, which I think is the most interesting thing as an architect. So the, the, if we imagine this starting point, we could imagine this as, you know, we're kind of in the Rhino model and there's this, this series of transformations which are applied to it. The first thing which happens is that... Mirror, control shift W. Actually, no, so I, I set that up as a custom keyboard shortcut. Normally you don't, yeah, yeah. I guess it's M M I R. Yeah, mirror. Enter. So you flipped it over. You've we're on the, the other side of the nave now. I think the first decision is that he wants to change the material palette because he works in marble. So we have a new element and we're going to have this play between the architectural framing, which is going to remain in grey stone, and the sculpture. These two are going to blur into one another, but the sculpture is going to be in white marble. And he hasn't quite like given up on the white marble. There's a problem with this white marble, which is that it's insanely expensive and hard to get hold of in big enough lumps, which is what he'd spent the last three years doing but anyway also the form of it starts to transform and it starts to grow upwards from being a cube the bottom part of it becomes this kind of this much taller rectangle and the 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 hemispheric dome shifts up half a story he's doing this for two reasons 
the first and most obvious one is actually he needs low he wants loads of space for his marble sculpture and if you just plonk it in it's just completely the wrong proportion it fills up the whole space and it needs space above it there is this rendered area above it to give it some breathing space but it it pushes everything up should we just describe what they are so the the thing that he's putting on the bottom is a flat wall is is the sort of wallized version of what he was doing for Pope Julius's tomb which is a mixture of a sort of architectural frame made of, you know, pilasters, sort of windowy shapes, niches, you know, a kind of assemblage of these classical shapes, which he does interesting things with, into which he puts sculptures. And in, in the final design, he's got this huge sort of urn with two sculptures reclining on it, one on either side, and with a sculpture in the middle. And there's another one on the other side, which is the sort of mirror with another two reclining figures and another urn. Should we talk a little bit about the frame? Like, it, as, it, as it goes up, one of the things about the way in which Michelangelo worked is that he would constantly revise up until the moment something was actually built and sometimes even afterwards. There's often a friction with clients when you ask them to demolish everything that you've built because you've changed your mind. This is a problem he regularly had. In this case, it means because he's very much developing while this chapel is being built, as we go up, the innovations which he's making on the accepted classical forms become more and more extreme. So right up at the top, he introduces these windows, which are completely unprecedented, which are not even rectangular. They're like a kind of trapezoid. They're sort of in false perspective. They try, like he's realised this space is really tall that I'm designing. I should make it taller, which is a very, that's a like good architectural move. If yeah. you've got something extreme, make it purposeful. But it's not something which anybody in an earlier generation would have thought of trying. It's the same thing that he does throughout the chapel, which is that he takes something which is nominally normal and then massively distorts it in a way which is done just by, he's got, a sculptural 3D idea of what he wants it to be like. He doesn't care at all about what they're meant to be like, and he just makes it. In these windows, which are up close to the dome, what has begun as an accepted form in which you have a window, two columns on either side of it, you have like a sill, and you have a little architrave on the top, a little tiny sort of flat pyramid. The columns and sill part have melted into each other and become the same form, and have become incredibly simplified. They're like a flat outline. The columns have drooped down below the level of the sill, so that they're dangling. And then the hole has splayed out, so that they're pointing out like these two legs. And it's very flat and simplified. Oh, also, the dome has changed on the top to now a sort of mini pantheon dome. Yeah, it's acquired these coffers. As we go down, the next layer is the most similar but it's got a bit more detail in the stonework. And then you get to the kind of these marble frames. This is where we get full-fledged Michelangelo strange classical detailing. I think this is where his um, innovation as an architect is like immediately obvious, is that he's taking this accepted register of elements and doing things which are not only new and innovative, but which have extremely striking effects. And I think that one of the challenges of this episode actually is for us to try and describe <laughs> what's going on in a way which is understandable. I mean, so if we look at the one above the door, the like tabernacle thingy above the door, yeah. so there's, there's these doors in the corners. And above the door is a sort of fake niche, which is even bigger than the door. The general rule of like the way he kind of creates these things is superficially they look like a form. But all the detail, and in fact the composition, has been collaged. The details are all changed, so he doesn't use things like, you know, we hear about classical orders. There's no classical orders in Michelangelo. He makes up all his elements from scratch. Well, not from scratch, from sort of dream recreations of other things. But that goes even to the point of the idea of an architrave, or the idea everything is cut, collaged, yeah. pulled, distorted... Things don't meet, things don't support, lines go over. The type which he's building from is a thing where you have a rectangular niche, like a recessed uh, rectangle, which you can put things in. And then you have a thing which is like a, a semicircle or like a, a sort of flattened semicircle supported on with a column on either side of the niche. And that whole thing is sitting on something at the bottom. That is what, at the most superficial level... Is progressing from 
And the transformations are in every element. So the most obvious thing is that the niche has grown up and sliced through the bottom of the the, the sort of pediment which should be sitting on. I don't know. Yeah, what the beam which the beam which the lintel it's the hole has gone through the lintel which should be theoretically supporting it. It's gone all the way through it. It's broken it in the middle. That hole has been subtracted and disappeared. And not only that, but it's then grown this strange little kind of limb on either side as if it's crawling round on top of the beam on either side. Yeah, it's sort of pushed up through the lintel and, and spread sort out. sort of squashed into the above lintel space. The curved part, which is meant to sit on top of that lintel has also got incrementally bigger so that it's no longer properly supported by it. And in the process, it's actually pressing up against the large columns which border it on either side, so that there's this real sense of pressure. Um, It's also broken again and pushed out a little bit in the middle. And it's also not sitting on its columns. There are these columns which are quite clearly to support this arch, and they barely touch. They've kind of sucked back into the wall unbalanced sort of way down the columns themselves are yeah have kind of shrunk into the wall and are extremely flat and they're also not really columns they look like these very thin long panels and they've got extremely weird capitals which are very very tall thin almost egyptian then at the bottom within the niche there's this thing which is like a sort of a shelf or base which is a box sort of thing which is kind of pushing right out for some reason but the thing is that he's done that sort of process to everything. Yeah, everything has become strange. He would model these things in clay first. He would do a certain amount of sketching. He'd model them in clay. And I'm not sure about f- for this project, but for lots of the other projects, he would have them made at one-to-one in wood and put in the situation so that he could examine how he wanted to change them. Drawing is not his principal method of thought. He thinks in three dimensions... And as a sculptor, elements of the building are sculptural, three-dimensional elements. A window becomes a potential for shapes, to explore a very free language of shapes. And his temperament in this is to create something which is bold, crisp, and a strange thing of, at one level, deeply harmonious, but also uncanny. It, it works strangely as a sepulchral, as, as, a, as a tomb. Not all of this is intentional. This, the, this chapel is very unbalanced, partly on purpose and partly by accident. He doesn't, and there are two ways in which it's unbalanced by accident. One of which is he doesn't finish designing it. So he keeps working and working and working and then he runs out of time. And then they just sort of slap in the sculptures that he's done which don't really fit... And also, so it's it's sort of not finished, it's just left off. And the other thing is, he hasn't brought together the elements. Although there are these moments where I think they work rather brilliantly together, the marble and the, the grey Pietra Sirena. These moments of real tension where they seem to kind of push out against one another, that the marble is almost kind of flexing against it. Could we talk about the relationship to the sculpture? Because I think there's a relationship in two ways. One is that the sculpture is literally contained within the architecture, and the other is that the effects of the architecture and the effects of the sculpture seem to have something to do with one another. So to describe the sculpture quickly, there are these four figures which represent night, day, dusk and dawn. I mean, how exactly they represent these things is absolutely... I mean, he has a real artist thing of like, oh, I've been commissioned to do something. I will slap a name on something to justify what I wanted to do. Which are these, like, four naked figures doing... Uh, in, in theory, I think they're meant to be... One is going to sleep, one is waking up, one is lethargically doing something, one is... I don't know. They're, yeah, it, they, but essentially they're all lounging. I want to call him out on that. I mean, this is rubbish. This is just... He has got an idea, and he wants to explore it, and he's given it some pretty thin... Our overarching theme. Should we talk about what they're doing though? Because I think that the the yeah. that their the way the body is articulated, the impression is very strong. There are these poses which are quite unnatural, where you know um, the figures are highly muscled and they're kind of reaching around. More than one of them, I think, have an arm kind of trapped underneath their body, which they're sort of 
pushing themselves up on or leaning down on. There's this real sense of frustrated energy or tension. They're kind of constricting themselves. So there are on, on either side, there are three figures. There's a sitting figure, which he's done a sort of competent job on. And I think it's very important because it's the figure of the person who's died and he sort of has to, he knows he's kind of got to knock them out. And then there are these two reclining figures, which are clearly not finished. Like there's bits where they're totally polished and there's bits where the stone is still, still which, which actually has this quite amazing effect. Like some of them, because some of them are falling asleep and they seem to be almost like falling back into the stone, which they were carved out of. The massive, brutal weight of these big sculptures thrusts three-dimensionality into the space if i if i want to kind of bullet point the things i want to say they are brutal and they absolutely smash away at this sort of notion of like like wherever the architecture is done it's really crisp and smooth and these are like hacked away at another thing is you see the strange focus and eye most people sculptors would firstly have a sense of the form and then perhaps work on the face or the hands or expressive parts. He doesn't do that. He always works out from the centre of the body, and it is always twisted and contorted. Yeah. And there are elements of the composition that lead me to think that things like the head is kind of an afterthought. One of them, literally, the head is the part which is left undone. It's undone and also, like, compressed into the body, strangely twisted and hidden behind a shoulder. They're filled with strength, but their strength is turned against themselves you know do you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah. they are contorted and twisting but also he's using this to show off muscles and to show off that core body in one of the you know that that sort of use of the, like like the knee you've got one elbow on the outside of the corresponding knee yeah. and it's showing that sort of bum and thigh and all those muscles yeah. along there in this sort of there's this woman who's got like seriously muscly thigh i mean there's there's slightly funny portraits i mean her breasts are basically sort of sacks of sand, which have been adhered to either just, you know, vertically down from her armpits. Yeah, they are coming much more out of the unconscious of Michelangelo, these. They belong much more to the slaves, but they're less well resolved. Where he actually has to put the sculptures in architectural compositions, he often can't resolve them. He's already got a whole palette of constraints for him, which is the piece of stone. He has this instinctive synesthetic relationship between a piece of stone and what he, he and the sort of spiritual power he thinks it has. If you visit it, it, I find it intensely eerie. There seems to be, for one thing, the statues, particularly the the sort of very unfinished twisted one where the the head is partly encased in the stone. Rightly or wrongly, they seem to be in pain. There seems to be something painful about this this kind of contortion which they're going through. And th- th- there seems to be this resonance between the stark, unfinished, unhappy sculptures and these often extremely stripped down, fractured, strange architectural forms. So, I mean, immediately above the sculptures are these niches where again a strange transformation has taken place the one containing a sculpture has been compressed so much that if the sculpture was ever to stand up he would bang his head and fall face forward onto the floor the other ones what should be really be an architrave surrounding them and framing the niche has all been taken away you have this incredibly minimal recess with just a simple Lintel. They're like a very serious, and also these these yeah. these these strange like transposed um, elements which are holding it. There up. are all these bits that at one time or other in the proposal had sculptures in them. Yes. So this is partly accidental. But it is also because of the way Michelangelo works, you can't really call anything accidental. He builds buildings very like sculptures, where he would be carving away at it, and he thinks like that. He thinks like this thing is half done, and he goes into the space, and he sort of wants to take his chisel out and whack away at the wall to make it. And that's innately what's going on. Yeah, you can't disentangle the the, the making from... He doesn't doesn't have this architectural notion of design as separate to making, to anything like the extent that we do. He would be aware of what was going on, and he looked at things all the time. One thing he does that architects don't do enough is he looked always at his building. 
There are so many accounts of him going and looking and trying things out physically in the space. This is, com- this is completely out of sequence, but I've remembered a funny story about um, the David, mm. which is that uh, I can't remember one of, the, one of the patrons kind of comes to uh, visit him when it's finished and complains that the nose is rather big. And so he goes, no, that's just because you're looking at it from below. It looks bigger from below. But maybe I'll take a little bit off it. So he climbs up onto the scaffold where he's very far up above him and he can't see what's going on. And he just taps his chisel like this so that dust comes off it and falls down. And then he goes, what do you think now? And he's like, oh, yes, it's much better. Which I think is an approach to dealing with clients which has not changed in 500 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we make it sound like he's a complete lunatic, but there's lots of um, wry, witty and bitchy commentary. Yeah, which yeah. Perhaps we should... yeah, we should try and get some of that in. There's some it's great... Bit, there's, there's, some a great... When, there's a bit when he goes to see uh, Titian yeah. uh, with Vasari yeah. in, in um, Venice and they leave the studio and Michelangelo says, well, he could have been a very good painter if only someone had taught him how to draw. Anyway, back to this thing... Yeah, there's so there's so much going on. I mean, also because they're like way too big. It, there's this strange trip hammer sense that the whole thing is about to fall apart. It's so different to the old sacristy, and they're so similar in shape. So the old sacristy is a piece of perfect harmony. You can have that like facial expression of Mary in it, you know, slightly drugged up harmony, perfect beauty. You know, yeah. this is raw, wrong. Brilliant, unresolved. I mean, my impression when I think of it, of having visited it, I remember what I think is the statue of Knight, which is the statue which is most contorted. The arm is behind, the legs are kind of crossed over one another. It's intensely powerful and muscled. And I think it's meant to be removing a mask from its face. But the whole head is partly shrouded in stone, which has never been carved away. And I think of this strange, menacing face and the way in which it's partly buried in this stone and this kind of suppressed power and but also this this kind of sense of kind of torment almost that's in it and then around it these niches which are so stark and stripped back and strange and kind of almost ruinous in that they seem so empty and they're something kind of skull-like, you know? It's like the eyes of a skull, these, these yeah. like, empty things Both which ought to be filled. Things. And the ruin behind is funny because the architecture, because of the sort of detailing, is perfect. It's like the ruin of the half-rubbed-out drawing. It's not... It's like your rhino... Yeah, 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 your rhino, going back to your rhino file, it's kind of got corrupted and, like, half the shapes have gone, but everything is perfect. Yeah, but this, it's, there's a real emptiness to it, which I think is, is accentuated by the choice of the marble, this, this like, white ghostly marble and it's so cold it's render is white and flat but marble holds lines so tightly which is this you know it can hold this amazing detail and that the blankness of blank marble is so intentful yes that's it isn't it because it can hold so much detail its emptiness is much emptier And there's also something about its reflectiveness, which is a little clammy. And slight translucency. I feel as if the new sacristy is the coldest place in the centre of Florence. Like, it's so cold-seeming. There's a real bodily chill. The whiteness does have something of, like, the whiteness of a corpse. It's very eerie. It's a it's an extraordinary extraordinary thing. I think we're getting towards wrapping up this episode. Go stick with us. The, uh, we haven't actually we've like rushed through a, most of his career without talking about very much of the sort of substantial architecture because it all comes at the end. Yeah. From being a prodigy at an extraordinarily young age, he will also be productive into his 80s. He's he's in his mid 40s at this point. And there's an awful lot to cover. And there are, in particular, there are also projects which we want to cover in a lot of detail in the next episode. And I think we might do some history as well. Yeah, if we people, Because I think it helps. It helps kind of... There's, I mean, we said it's a, bit like, it's a bit like describing, if we were doing Le Corbusier, what happened in Europe between, let's say, 1870 and 1970. There's an awful lot more to cover. Yeah, we've got more buildings. An awful people lot like more buildings. buildings. And, yeah, I can't really remember what else was important. It doesn't matter, we'll say it all in the, like, enormously long other episodes. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. 
see you next time. Yeah, I'm going next time. Like, we should just have some loud disco music. I think yeah. it's got to be quite up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're looking to we yeah. claim him for the. Uh, we're gonna. Yeah. We're really. We're looking forward to. Gaze at David. You can't be him, but you can admire him. You can always zoom in. Yeah. <laughs> See you next time. Bye bye. I was waving. Thank you.